Okay, we're recording live. All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for stopping by. As always, our guest today has worked in journalism and media for over 30 years as a journalist, talk show producer, news director, and program director. Ian developed and conducts workshops for journalists on human rights in regions such as South Sudan, Kenya, Syria, and more. Also, in college, he founded the first pirate radio station in South Africa. Pretty freaking sweet. All right, everybody, please welcome our guest today, Ian Koningfest. Ian, thank you so there much for coming go. on the show. How are you doing today? I'm doing, I'm doing great. When you talk about pirate radio, I remember the days with the big hair, the tie-dyed shirts, and... Um, some groovy music but uh those were that's right that's right yeah. that's right yeah <laughs> <laughs> i could just imagine you in the tie-dye shirt and the big hair yeah <laughs> that, that <was> me. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what we do what we do uh, on our show here is we do things uh a thing called two truths and a lie and uh, so Ian has sent us a couple of little pointers and I'm going to read them out and Devin and I are going to guess which one is the lie. Okay. So, so Dev, you ready? You ready, Dev? I'm ready. Yeah, let's okay, see. here we go. So Ian, uh, let's see, he pioneered North America's first all traffic station, all traffic radio station or all traffic station. Yeah. Okay. Right. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, um, number two, he has jumped off the highest commercial natural bungee jump in the world. Damn. Mm, I can believe that too. And number three, um, I crashed on my mountain bike in Moab with Nigel and got skewered by a juniper bush through the leg and had to be heliovac out. Holy crap. I can't comment on that. <laughs> <laughs> Devin's going to have to guess. I have what in the world? Oh my goodness! Oh my goodness! <laughs> so, Dad, what do you think? The, here? So the the North American traffic state, yeah, that that's like it could be too real that it's that it's a lie. You know, he could just be throwing us off here, um, jumping off the bridge. I can I can see him sending an off a bungee jump. Uh, mm -hmm. crashing, getting a juniper berry bush in the leg. Like what the heck now? What? I don't know. I'm all, I'm all wrapped up. I'm just going to go with maybe the obviously true, possibly fake one. We'll go with the f number one. <laughs> Punch me in for number one, Nige. Number one. Number one. Okay. 500 on number one. Let's see. I, uh, da, 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 da. I'm going to go, I'm going to go with number one as well. Oh, yeah. How did we do? So, Ian, what's the... So, number one is true. Number of one course. is true. Of course. We should have known. <laughs> I think they all must be true. <laughs> um, well, number three isn't true. He did get... He was with me in, in Moab and did have an accident and ended up in the hospital, but it wasn't a juniper bush through the leg and there wasn't a helicopter involved. So, this so... Is a that was a camper. That was a camper <laughs> van. There was a camp. There was a. That's right. We got you in a camper van. Yes, you on a camper van with a shot of whiskey. With a shot of whiskey and took you to the hospital. That's right. That's right. Right. A shot of whiskey fixes everything. Uh, yeah. So what happened there then? You you took a bail or wait what? You yeah, I wanted them? to. I wanted to make the other guys look like better riders than me, so I took a tumble. Took one for the team. Yeah, he did. He did. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, there's one that I that I dropped off here. I, I took off the end was one that your radio name was uh, Ian K. Was that one true? That one was not true. In fact, one of my first news editors said Koenigsfest was too difficult to pronounce. So why don't I change my name to Ian King? Which oh, I did about kidding. 10 minutes oh. and then decided my name is my name. And uh, if it's too difficult to pronounce, don't introduce me. <laughs> nice so so i get let's let's go back uh let's go back a long long while here back in south africa you're you're originally from south africa you're now living in vancouver and been here for many many years um but you you you, you also uh, studied political science at university in cape town i understand and you mentioned to me that you ran um a pirate radio station so that's hear a little bit about that. That's kind of cool. 
Well, uh, um, I've, I've watched, I mean, there's that, the British film, which was remarkable. It's one of my favorite films of all time is Fire Radio. So you guys are a bunch of rebels. <clears throat> Yeah, so I was running the, the local radio station at um, the University of Cape Town. And uh, this was during the time of heightened political tension, yeah. state of emergency, police and mm -hmm. troops on our campus. And mm -hmm. we were, as reporters, not able to report what we saw. Because mm -hmm. if you had a story about any unrest or violence, you um, had to get a police officer to verify the information. And most times they said it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. um, so a couple of us got together and we decided to petition. There's an international body that basically is an arbitrator of uh, licensing. And we had applied in South Africa for yeah. a radio license and were denied. But we decided if we were going to be denied, we would give it one more legal chance. So we applied mm -hmm. to the international body, which I believe is housed or was housed in Paris for a ruling on the denial of the, the radio license. And this body, which was under extreme pressure from the South African government, refused to hear our case. So we thought this was sufficient grounds to um, mm. launch our own radio station, because yeah. up until then, the station was sort of um, hardwired through the university campus. So it had a, a no reach beyond the, the university. Mm. Okay. Um, and so with some brave engineering students who built <laughs> an FM transmitter, oh we uh, started broadcasting at 104.5. Uh -huh. Initially, it just got down to the university residences, which were probably a couple of kilometers away. But uh, we then got a stronger signal and probably for the, the better part of six and a half months, oh. with the knowledge of the university president, we oh. had an illegal radio station. Oh. And... Um, it was an incredible example of grassroots support. Just by word of mouth, mm. people figured out what we were doing. And so we would have music, but we would have news on the hour and on the half hour. And we were mm. truly independent. We had no political object, objective except to tell the truth of what was happening. Wow. And um, we were fueled on whiskey and cheeseburgers to keep this operation going. The, the one condition I made with the, in, the two engineering guys was never tell anyone where the transmitter is because yes. we knew we were breaking um, legislation. And if we knew where the transmitter was, we would give up the story. Right. So, yeah. Rupert and Gwen, the two engineers, and uh, I haven't been in touch with them probably in 30 years. Yeah. set up the transmitter and only they were the only two people who knew where it was. Mm. Um, our days came to a very heavy crashing end when we were visited by three police officers and the university president. Mm. And I was asked to take the police officers to the transmitter so that they could shut it down. Mm. And the more I said, I didn't know where it was, the more I realized this was getting rather scary. <laughs> um, there was a penalty of 12 years in jail oh. for illegal broadcasting. Oh. And what, was, what happened then was the university brokered a deal with the police that if we shut the operation down, no one would be prosecuted. But what we had done most importantly was given people in Cape Town in the close environment of the university an idea of how different the reality was compared to what the licensed broadcasters were allowed to tell right, and right. it started a movement in terms of people demanding to be heard and it was a very i mean i don't want to inflate the importance of the radio station but it did provide a small but important part of the anti-apartheid struggle in mm. terms of leading to changes which would come several years later um, and th that was sort of my introduction to the importance of radio as a medium for messaging. This was mm -hmm. before social media. This was before the internet was as robust as it has become. Yeah. But the essence of local news storytelling uh, was an incredible, powerful tool and um, in many ways hasn't changed at all. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. w w when I wasn't running the radio station, I was dabbling in my studies and uh, my thesis was looking at the importance of distance education through radio. 
uh -huh. which in itself has become a major factor. And ironically, part of what I do now is doing workshops is teaching through distance because of COVID. Um, yeah, yeah. And so in many ways, what I was doing in the, in the early and mid eighties has come full circle to what I'm doing now, which uh, brings me much joy. Yeah, but, um, yeah. The heady days at university with um, <laughs> police on campus, tear gas, random arrests, um, just basically the, the, the raw struggle for political opportunity and political rights was evident everywhere in that country at that time. And Nelson Mandela was still imprisoned at that time, obviously. I, I yes, he was. Right. He was, he was yeah. when I left um, so South Africa to move to Canada, he was still in prison for a couple more years. Yeah, he was. Wow. Wow. And the radio state, this radio station. So I, I'm, I'm curious because there's a film that came out just, I don't know, just recently and it's Sugar Man and it's about Rodriguez, mm, the right. musician out of Detroit. I think he's an American. Yeah. And he was, he was this musician and never heard in the United States, but he was extremely popular in South Africa. And so, you know, we playing that, you know, we playing that type of stuff as well. You know, some of the Rodriguez tunes that he had going lots along with us. Yeah, a lot of Rodriguez <laughs> and sort of the protest movement of, of Bob yeah. Dylan and right. I mean, it was, an eclectic, it was an eclectic music station. But what we did highlight was that at the top of the hour, people could rely on the fact that we had a dedicated team of student journalists who were going to tell the story and um, that that we stayed true to until we got shut down. And uh, mm. the station is still operating now. It's fully licensed and legal. And uh, it's, uh, I, I just think it's it's time to acknowledge the, the brave engineers and the people who soldiered on in terms of providing news and reporting with great personal danger to themselves. Um, mm, yeah. So, yeah, it was. Do you uh, know, do you know, is it still 104.5? Do you know? It is. Yes. It is still well, 104.5. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Wow. Yeah. That's fantastic. And to this day, I have no idea where the transmitter was. I know it was somewhere, <laughs> near, the, somewhere near the library. <laughs> is that right? Yeah. Oh my gosh. So what was it like for a young guy uh, you know, growing up in South Africa during the apartheid movement. And I know, you know, you, you now live in Canada and have for many years, you know, what was that, where was that tipping point that said, you know, I, I need to, I, I have to leave. Um, well, the tipping was point like? was, was long in the making. Um, basically every um, white South African male was subject to military conscription. That's right. For two years. And uh, the only way you could defer your military training was by going to university. So I was never the strongest student at high school, but I decided university would be a good avenue. So I was at uh, studying political science and just got more and more involved in radio, which I would always been interested in since a kid. I would always sort of do mock play by play broadcasts and do news broadcasts for myself. And um, sort of went to bed every evening listening to the radio so ever since i was five or six i knew radio was something i wanted to be in and so soon after getting on campus i got involved in the student radio and was focusing on the news and programming side of it um, but i realized at some point my time of university life because you could only defer for six years would sort of come to an end and the choices at the time were to do military service which to me was be, sort of signing up to be part of the apartheid state yes. uh, yeah. to be exempt through studies or to leave the country mm. and uh, leaving the going to jail for six years plus seemed like a narrow option that didn't mm. really provide the type of work that I think could help bring about change in the country mm -hmm. which I'd been involved in so um, yeah. My sister had already moved to Canada and uh, it was a country that gave me another opportunity in life and I'm forever grateful for that opportunity. And so um, pretty much um, I was organizing my, my immigration papers um, during the, the last few months of the, the pirate radio broadcast. And then uh, I left mm. with my wife in early 1989. Oh my gosh. And then you came and did you come straight to Vancouver or were you spent uh, a few along the in way? Saskatoon? Oh, okay. Because okay. a lot of actually in Saskatchewan, my brother in law is a doctor and a lot of South Africans moved to Canada and worked in sort of in the prairies. And so 
uh, a few weeks in uh, North Battleford, Saskatchewan, I realized that there may be warmer <laughs> parts of this country that I need to investigate. <laughs> oh, man. But it, it was bittersweet leaving because um, at that point, there was no real clarity where the country was going. Mm -hmm. And so, um, as I say, my contribution was was incredibly small, but it, it laid the seed for, for radio as a as a protest movement and then becoming a legitimate form of um, a legitimate voice for people. Mm -hmm. Wow. Deb, did you have, did you have a question there? I thought you were. Ah, no, yeah, I do. Um, that's just all so crazy. Holy smokes. My mind's just a little bit blown right now. So I'm just, <laughs> but Ian, yeah. So I, I see that um, Nelson Mandela is somebody that you um, looked up to and obviously he's been very influential across the world. But as a South African, I can understand that his words and spirit must have hit you differently in these uh, these times. So can you just express like how his how his teachings and how his spirit like affected you? Well, it was I guess the the ability to to wait and not not give in to the demands of the state to try it on many occasions to well physically to and emotionally to break him. Mm -hmm. and to get him to succumb to their demands. And uh, he stoically waited until the time was right for him to, to take a deal and to leave prison and, and become the leader of the new South Africa. And it was that patience that I've never been able to actually fulfill myself, but it was just mm -hmm. seeing that patience, the, the, the violence that he endorsed was of such a limited scale in, in, in the reality of the struggle in South Africa. And uh, he brought a calming motion where people thought the country could never survive. Yes, there have been problems, but if you look at the context of how that country emerged and the, the subjugation of black people for a generation, mm -hmm. that what has come out of it is an absolute miracle. And there are many people in, in South Africa, contemporary South Africa, who believe that Mandela was not uh, the savior of emancipating black people because he gave up too much. I'm, I'm not a believer of that theory. And I think that he laid the foundation for a movement that um, allowed for the most peaceful transition possible in terms of trying to understand the context and you know, the brutality that I experienced was minimal compared to, to black people. And uh, I, I will never forget that I, I had privilege as we've discussed numerous times in Canada, people have privilege and some people are born with privilege and others not. It was no different there. And um, I, I bear few scars compared to, to other people but Mandela was someone I always respected. And even though, as I say, there's been sort of a revisionist theory placed upon some of his work, um, he certainly has been a guiding light for me and for millions of people. And ironically, um, the organization where I do work now for Journalists for Human Rights, um, one of Mandela's grandsons, uh, Siubela Mandela, is the coordinator in parts of Africa for the organization. So another sort of re re meeting of uh, or a crossroads in terms of people and places right it's incredible so in your story is is remarkable because i mean you you left south africa under apartheid you came to canada and you you really i mean you're a very modest guy but you really built um a life for yourself but also um quite notable one in radio and and whatnot here in 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 canada and which, you know, I, I really admire you for, and, you know, on our, our mountain bike trips and whatnot, um, you know, you've talked a little bit about it, but what, what I, you know, I really admire you in your recent years of what you've been able to do in going back to Africa and going back into um, areas, you know, where, you know, communicate over um, Instagram and stuff while you're in South Sudan and, Mali or wherever you are and you've gone back and you're giving back to the journalists and you're you're helping train journalists in these countries uh, where you where you originated and you know you built a, a great life for yourself here and really had a great career in in what you were doing here and now you know going back and, and doing what you're doing and it's it's it actually it blows my mind I mean I've been fortunate to to spend some time in North Africa and in Africa and then with other 
other other journalists, actually, Devin and I and our family were in Kenya and Ethiopia about two years ago with um, um, Salim Amin, who's the son of Mohammed Amin, which is a very famous uh, Kenyan journalist that was the uh, the fellow that actually got into um, uh, in, was in Ethiopia and he got to the Quorum Plateau during the 1984 famine and got on a military transport, risked his life um, and got uh, photographs and video footage out of the famine taking place on the Quorum Plateau, millions of people starving to death and got it out to Britain and New York. And the journalists, you know, they, they just risk their lives to get the true story out. And what's been happening globally, you know, in the past couple of years too, that a lot of us don't know about is they go missing, they get kidnapped, they get murdered. Uh, journalism has become a target, even in the United States, uh, in, you know, uh, in the past, you know, four or five years, uh, journalists were targets. And, uh, you know, you guys, um, you know, risk your lives to get the true stories out. And so, I just, I just want to know a little bit about, you know, your revisit, like going back into Africa, going back into Africa and the young, I think they're, I'm assuming they're young, the young journalists that you've been training. Um, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about what you've been up to there. Cause it's, to me, it's just totally inspirational and fascinating. Sure, yeah. Well, yeah. so w when I came to Vancouver, I had written to probably, and in those days there were 25 newsrooms. So I, I wrote to every news director in the city, telling them about the experience I had as new to Canada, hoping to get an interview. And um, yeah. I didn't ever get an interview. Uh, I got a couple of notes. Some people said with an accent like that, you'd never work in radio. Um, <laughs> so I was forced to, and I say forced, I wasn't sort of had a gun to my head, but I went to BCIT to the broadcast program, yeah. which I thoroughly endorsed. And uh, after the first year, I got hired on at CKNW and sort of went from the most junior person there to brand director in a career of 25 years. And that was fantastic and challenging. And um, I also did launch uh, North America's first all traffic station. Um, and so lots of milestones, lots of great work met and worked with fantastic people and really had the opportunity to do a lot of travel and, and do journalism. And, and that was fantastic. Times change and um, my tenure came to an end and, and all's good. And uh, at the time I was president of the RTDNA, which is the Radio Television News, Digital News Association of Canada, mm -hmm. which um, was basically a group of news directors who um, put together an annual conference and has a very prestigious award program. And I was heavily involved in that and um, got a call from someone I never knew who said, uh, do you want to meet for a coffee? I'm with Journalists for Human Rights, which I'll admit I hadn't heard of either. Um, and I thought he was going to talk about getting involved in our conference, which was a minor point, part of that discussion. But he said, would I be interested in doing some training with Journalists for Human Rights? Mm -hmm. So I said, fantastic, in Toronto. And he said, no, in Juba, South Sudan. <laughs> My geography wasn't that Good, and I didn't really know much about South Sudan, which is the, the youngest country in the world, got its independence in 2011 after separating from Sudan. And so I Googled South Sudan and the first hit that I got was that the president had declared that journalists who asked questions that he wasn't comfortable with should be shot and killed. So I decided to tell my wife I was going on an excursion, but I wasn't sure I should tell her where I was going to. Um, <laughs> Anyway, Journalists for Human Rights has turned out to be a wonderful organization. Um, it has trained nearly 18,000 journalists around the world. And uh, its mandate is to provide training for journalists in terms of journalism, as well as in media management, and then allow those local trained journalists and media managers to keep training other people. And so they have local embedded lead team leaders, um, as well as uh, experts from generally from Canada and from other African countries who work and work with local media outlets in order to teach basic everything from basic journalism to human rights reporting to gender equality. It's a full gamut of, um, mm. of teaching. And uh, I've spent, I've done four trips to, to South Sudan, yeah. uh, met some incredible people and it's the bravery of these journalists that just blows me away in terms of people 
literally risking their lives as people did in South Africa when I was living there. People who have nothing to gain except to pass on storytelling and to tell their truth. Yes. And what I've learned, regardless of where you are in the world, no matter what you try and do, you cannot deny people the right to their truth. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And um, my first trip to South Sudan, it was mm-hmm. just arriving there and having this warm greeting and staying where a lot of um, expats stayed at a place called Lagali House, which used to be sort of a, a ministerial mansion, which is a mansion by a long, not a mansion by a long stretch, but the camaraderie of journalists and NGO workers and um, civil society, basically trying to help provide a roadmap for a country that's hurting and still fighting to find peace and Journals for Human Rights sort of stands head and shoulders in my mind in terms of what it's doing to provide um, teachings and knowledge to journalists in, in really difficult places. So mm-hmm. my trips to South Sudan are, are always going to be very special to me and uh, the people I met uh, and, and worked with um, are incredible. W- one quick anecdote, um, I was working mm-hmm. in my first workshop with a group um, there were about 25 media managers and many of them, they were competitors. They hadn't really been in the same room together talking about issues. And what they realized was they all had the same common problems, which are no different to problems we have in North America, funding issues, equipment, Mm -hmm. uh, harassment in the workplace. I mean, there, there are issues which are mirrored no matter where you're teaching. And one of the station managers, his name was Flex. And uh, I said, Flex doesn't sound like an African name. He said, no, my parents called me Flex because they said to survive in South Sudan, you have to be flexible. (laughs) You've got to be adaptable and flexible. So anyway, Flex said, and I did my workshop for a week. And uh, he said next to his bed, he has three books, Mm -hmm. the Bible, a dictionary, and my workbook. And that was so overwhelming for me to, oh, wow. to see that my little contribution was making a difference to someone was just really fantastic. So that, wow. those are the memories of South Sudan. So with the um, pandemic, the travel was obviously curtailed, but what it has done, it's allowed me to still do my workshops and I've recently done 12 workshops uh, with journalists and media managers in Mali, Kenya, uh, Syrian refugees in um, Turkey, as Mm -hmm. well as Tunisia. And that's Mm -hmm. going to be on an ongoing project with with those groups. And as I say, there's nothing more rewarding than hearing the participants have an open discussion about finding opportunities amidst their hardships. Mm -hmm. And that's really what it is. As I said earlier, it's about telling stories, the ability to tell stories and to manage the flow of information. You know, with COVID, there was a lot of disinformation. Um, The fake news era went far beyond the United States. And um, Mm -hmm. it was incumbent on these students, rather these journalists in in these countries that I've just mentioned, who had to go out and and be COVID truth tellers um, in order to protect their population. So... um, There's a lot of incredible work being done at grassroots level. And um, I know that uh, Mm. the government of Canada has provided um, grants and and money to many of these NGOs. And uh, I think those are always tax dollars well spent, both internationally as well as JHR does a lot of work with First Nations leaders Mm -hmm, and First Nations mm -hmm. communities. And um, um, they are just heroic in terms of the the work that they are. Yeah. Do, do you think that, you know, because we've been living through this COVID uh, epidemic for, you know, quite a long time now that, you know, um, it, it's it's more difficult for the truth to get out in some of these countries because in the, it's during COVID, I mean, we've watched um, a civil war flare up where we were we were two years ago we we're in Ethiopia and Mekale, um, where there's a civil war that's that's that started there. We have um, Myanmar where we happened to be a couple of years ago as well um, with Aung San Suu Kyi, you know, um, 
getting taken and and you hear these little flare-ups of news but then it kind of disappears and i'm just wondering would we get a better story um have have things been um tainted a little bit or a little bit more difficult because of what we're living in right now I, and i really noticed that um, something's hot for about three days. Um, you know, you hear about Myanmar and so many people getting killed in Myanmar and then it'll kind of fade and then something else will pop. But, and, you know, and Bolsonaro in, in Brazil with, you know, what's going on in the Amazon and all this other stuff is, is it of, um, what do you think about that? You know, is it, is it um, like what's happening like right now during this COVID well, I, I think because of the extensive COVID coverage, and I, I'm not disagreeing with it because I think it's important because of all yeah. the, the areas it has, but it, it sort of pushes down the, the importance of other stories. Right. And, and therefore, you need something catastrophic to happen in order mm. for those stories to reemerge. Right. Um, and it's, it's a balancing act, and it comes back to resources because, um, you know, a lot of news organizations don't have the international reach that they used to. And they also therefore don't have the capacity to be telling those stories. So uh, in Myanmar, for example, the, the government has, has been uh, all fairly successful in terms of, of keeping those stories under control. Yeah. However, um, there are journalists, and I know that Clarissa Ward from CNN recently got in, and once again, she's just the highlight of the story, but it's the people who... Are risking their lives to give the three finger salute yeah. who are really putting their lives on the line in order to to get their stories out so you know i think with fact checking and and the ability to use social media effectively mm -hmm. um th those stories are still getting out but they don't get the same attention that they used to simply because news organizations around the world don't have the ability to tell the stories the same way uh. um and the flip side to that is with, with social media and disinformation, it's as dangerous often because people don't know what's going on. Right. Mm -hmm. That's why groups that are working with journalists and providing tools and knowledge to be able to circumvent the roadblocks that the authorities are putting up is so important. And um, mm -hmm. with, with thousands of journalists around the world who are not working for big organizations they are still struggling away to 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 meet deadlines and to tell stories and to put their lives at risk and and those people need to be saluted because their action is heroic yeah yes right. absolutely yeah oh my gosh i know it's um yeah our hats off to them i mean we've been so fortunate over the past several years to meet um quite a few people in this space you know the journalists the documentary filmmakers and and just sharing their stories, you know, Devin, Devin spent time, you spent time in Peru, but also with us in Africa with Chip Duncan, who's a documentary filmmaker. And he's, you know, Afghanistan, he was in Afghanistan and he was all these places and you sit around um, a fire at night and have a beer and hear these stories that just people just don't hear, you know, and it's, you know, just my hats off to, you know, what you guys and, and all of the, the, the younger and the, the new, you know, the journalists, they're risking their lives. Um, to get these the real stories out, you know, and um, yeah, I you know, um, did you have another a question there, Deb? I don't know what. To... <laughs> um, I don't know. I got yeah, I got one that kind of popped in my brain now, but uh, I think the people yeah. the people want to know, and mm. uh, of course, you know, you've, you've been in a lot of situations from the pirate radio, you know, potentially getting arrested, all these all these sorts of things. But mm. I think the people want to know is what what did one of the hairiest days look like? for you as a journalist in the field or? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think, you know, the, the, the day we were confronted at the university radio station uh, with the police, the warrant for your arrest and demanding where the transmitter was will always stay in my mind. Um, and if it wasn't the, the deft uh, handling by the university administrator, we may well have been carted away and uh, who knows what would have happened. Uh, you know, mm. many of my friends and in fact, the news director at the student radio station was detained and held without trial for months, um, which had a profound impact on, on his life and on his family's life. Mm. Um, and then I, I think um, just naively landing in, in Juba for the first time, not really knowing uh, and I was very well taken care of, but it's just that level of unknown 
mm. and told under no circumstances take pictures because taking pictures is t strictly illegal in South Sudan. Um, mm. So I, I know nat our natural instinct with Instagram and everything else is to just start taking pictures of everything. So yes. it was just a case of mm. being very streetwise and keeping your head down, but knowing that the risks you are taking are far outweighed by the importance of the work you're doing, providing training and knowledge to journalists in that country. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, the couple of times we were out at night and there were roadblocks and you, you just have to rely on your good faith and on common sense and, and, and be aware. But throughout my career and the work I've done, I've always known that um, I come from a place of privilege and, and, to try and turn that place of privilege into uh, an opportunity to give back has always been very important to me. Right. Yeah. 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 Well, so on a, on a, on a lighter note, <laughs> you want to ask a burger question, Def? <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So we're just going to flip the train here. We're going to go the other direction, but I know you're a big burger enthusiast. We, we checked it out. You're a big burger enthusiast. I know, but uh, veggie burgers I see. And the thing is the whole world I think is going towards that. I've been doing pescatarian for like a year and a half now. Girlfriends are vegetarian. All our friends are being vegetarians now so i just wanted i was just wondering what what was the reason for how long have you been a vegetarian and what what was the reason i've been a vegetarian now for probably 20 years and mm. uh it was sort of a combination of sort of there were health factors in my family history in terms of uh, cholesterol and high blood pressure and heart disease and so that seemed an easy change for me to make um, although some people in my family thought that it would not happen, but it has been. My wife and, uh, and children are, are vegetarian. Um, and I went on this odyssey a few years ago to um, try and have and evaluate one veggie burger a week. Some weeks there were more. Uh -huh. than okay. yeah. And uh, I would hmm. give them my rating, which was not scientific at all. It was just based on the moment. <laughs> um, so people did try and... Uh, catch me out on the methodology, uh, but there wasn't methodology except for hunger and uh, quenching of, of desire. And uh, I finally came up, so I probably reviewed close to 55 or 60 in that year. Um, and it was an incredible process because when you're doing something like that, there is no right or wrong answer. Right. And uh, I would always sort of favor towards marking up than marking down. So m most got at least a 50 plus rating. Um, and that's probably in my back list for something to do again, once travel restrictions have been lifted is to make it m perhaps more of an international focus in terms of mm. where is the best veggie burger in the world in terms of where my travels take me. And I must tell you the veggie burger at Lagali House in Juba, South Sudan, rated extremely well uh, oh, wow with a, with a cold uh beer it was a, a perfect way to end the day oh, oh there you go oh, <laughs> yes it's it's interesting because all of our i mean our kids everybody that we know that the younger people they all seem to be vegetarian pescatarian vegetarian these days i'm reiko and i uh we've been going that way but we kind of have a little bit of supplemental meat occasionally. We had, we had my sister, my sister just sold her ranch. She had a ranch for like 25 years and raised cattle and whatnot. So we'd buy half a cow occasionally. So we, we have freezers full of this beef and we don't really eat that much beef anymore. So it's like, we, you know, we've been giving a little bit away, but we, you know, we've been every week, we have a little bit now and again, but we're, we're kind of, you know, hitting that way too. So I think Ian, yeah, every time we go down to Moab, you know, I, order my burger or whatever it is and i get this you know this this you know this look it's it's, it's an okay look and then chris chris as well you know both you guys you know ever consider being a vegetarian and i'm like well, yeah i considered it but since we've had those talks i've gone quite a far quite far in that direction so yeah <laughs> i guess i thank you for that i don't know <laughs> well it's it's a small from my perspective now is it's more an environmental choice than than anything and yes. um you know, even if you are a meat eater, if you cut down by 20% or yeah. 
it, it makes a difference. Mm, it does. And yeah. I think in, in these sort of global issues, um, it's a case of where where one person can make a difference really does count. You know, when you start accumulating all of that for a community and a country. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, and I, I, like, like you're right. I think it's an, I keep saying that, you know, a lot of the, so there's so many times where we all want to help, we want to give back, we want to contribute, but we, we go down that path and then we get to a point where we're like, am I really making a difference? Am I really making a difference? I'm doing my little bit, but does it really make a difference? But I honestly believe that collectively we do make a difference. And so from going to the vegetarian, um, the journalists getting their, their message out, I'm sure there's days where they sit there and they're in a war-torn country and they're, they're trying to get the story out and they go, you know, is it really going to make a difference? But it does make a difference. Yeah, collectively, absolutely. collectively together, we, we do make a difference. And, and that's why Devin and I, you know, we, we started this podcast because we've been so fortunate to, to travel a, a lot. We're, we're very privileged and be able to travel, but meet incredible people around the globe that are making a difference. And that's why, you know, it, it, we feel it's, a, it's our duty. It's important to share, help share their stories. So, and, um, and you're definitely, definitely one of them and you're one of those game changers. And we just want to thank you so much, Ian, for, being on our show today there and i think we'll um yeah, we'll wrap well, it up on the veggie burger there we'll definitely up. well i'd like to hit you with one more question just before oh, yeah. we go Maybe here just to, a plug at the, at the end of this yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> just to wrap it all together here one more um so if you could uh let's say go back go back in time to like a, a teenage version of yourself somebody who's you know inspired by the radio you've been looking you've, you've been listening to it since you were very young um what would be your the knowledge that you've acquired over the years that you would go back to and tell tell yourself what's the key point that you would tell yourself mm-hmm. i think um the key point is take more risk mm. ah, ah. because and it's a cliche but i think it's true there is with no risk, there's no reward. And I don't mean taking reckless risks. I mean, push the envelope a little bit more. Um, in, enlarge your ability or create a sense of pushing and pushing and pushing until you can no longer make any more progress. Um, and that would be the, the, the lesson. And, and I've been taught that by so many brave journalists uh, in the countries that I'm working who are taking risks, not recklessly, and I don't mean that recklessly, I mean, sometimes it's considered risk, but it's important because it allows you to be able to push the boundaries and the parameters ever so slightly. Mm -hmm. And if everyone is doing that, centimeters become meters and meters become kilometers. And I think that's what I would have come back and told myself, and maybe I would have been able to be even more effective. Amazing. But in, if I can just say, whether it's a veggie burger or a pint of beer or a cup of tea, there's a cost involved and there needs to be a cost involved in terms of journalism. So my appeal is to support local journalism. Um, sometimes they pay walls because people need to provide for their families. And so if you cannot find information for free, Sometimes you need to pay a few dollars in order to get access to information. And so my appeal is in order to help organizations such as Journalists for Human Rights, if you have the ability, make a donation. Mm -hmm. And if you have the ability to subscribe to a a news organization, particularly a local one, I heartily encourage that because um, there have been so many dozens and dozens and hundreds of journalists in Canada alone who've lost their jobs in the last year. Yeah. Um, I, I think that that would be my, my calling is to provide, and it's, it's not a huge investment to subscribe to a, a weekly editorial or a daily podcast, um, mm-hmm. but it makes a difference. It, it allows more people to be telling their truths and the more truths we hear, the stronger we are as a community. Right. Wow. Right. So true. Oh, excellent. Oh, man. Well, I think we're going to wrap it up there. If you guys would like to know more about Ian, we're going to put some links in the description to everything that he's got going on. Other than that, thank you so much for being on the show. I know it means a lot to me and my dad here. And uh, yeah, that was just a really, really, really appreciate that. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you so much, Ian. Really, really appreciate it. Take care. Yeah. Yeah. Take care. Cut the